Hello and welcome. This is Tom Connolly, President and Chief Investment Officer at Verson Capital Management, uh, to talk about briefly about a concept that's in the news a lot lately and can affect everyone's investment portfolio, namely uh, inflation. And we're most concerned about unexpected inflation or ex inflation that comes in higher than what is built into market expectations. Uh, that's that's what we're covering mostly in this talk. So we'll start with a little bit of a definition, looking a little bit at the history of uh, inflation and how it's measured and then how it impacts um, investments and what some takeaways might be uh, to, uh, for an investment portfolio. So let's begin. Typically, uh, inflation is measured by the consumer price index, and it measures uh, in, inflation is 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 basically a, a general increase in prices and the fall in the purchasing power of money. So, in other words, uh, at the beginning of a year, um, if you have a, a hundred dollar bill, and inflation is up three percent, at the end of the year, you can only buy. $97 worth of goods and services relative to the beginning of the year. You know, 3% of your spending power vanishes due to inflation. And so the consumer price index uh, has a number of components in it, uh, housing, apparel, transportation, education, recreation, medical care, and food and beverage. Um, and uh, they, they are typically tracked on a weighted index, uh, and that can change over time. But what the index is generally trying to reflect is what um, a basket of goods and services that a typical consumer might purchase at a, at a given point in time, how that's affected um, by where the dollar is moving. So I included this chart because um, it shows uh, the behavior of inflation uh, from 1800 to the present. But you, if you look, uh, the zero line, anything below the zero line means deflation. In other words, negative inflation, where the purchasing power of your dollar actually increases. And the positive means inflation, where you are lo losing purchasing power. And before the Depression, you know, before the, or basically uh, before World War II, you can see there were numerous occasions where there was deflation and inflation. And in fact, up until, you know, through the depression, really, these kind of canceled out, but there were big moves up and big moves down. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was chartered and one of its mandates was to uh, preserve the purchasing power of our currency. Um, and if you look at, the post-World War II period, uh, which is a little bit of a lag after the central bank was formed, but you can see we have a pretty much consistent environment of just positive inflation, some of it pretty big um, in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. But what we did effectively uh, during that time with our government policy was we said, we will trade the disruptive effects of uh, the deflation for consistent positive inflation, because deflation can be very disruptive as well. Uh, usually in these historical periods of deflation, people were out of work and the economy stalled. So the takeaway from this chart is that uh, aggressive man government management of, of, of the dollar started during the um, uh, chartering of the, of the central bank, and we're trading positive inflation uh, for, uh, to avoid the deflationary periods, which were so disruptive. But you can see since the establishment of the Federal Reserve, inflation has been positive and meaningfully so. Uh, that's takeaway number one for today. Um, there are two types of uh, inflation that are typically talked about. Uh, the the um, PC index, which measures um, how, uh, as another measure of inflation is split into headline and core. And the headline um, inflation number uh, 
is the one that includes food and energy and the core measure excludes food and energy. And the reason being food and energy prices in the short run can be much more volatile. And you can see that in this chart where the, um, the uh, headline in the dark green has bigger highs and bigger lows than the, the gold line, in, in, which is dash, which is just a core measure. So the, the feeling or the thought there is that the core measure more accurately captures long-term trends. So right now you can see historically there have been some pretty big swings and we have the big COVID decline here built in and then a sharp snap back in prices. So the big debate today is what is uh, the recent rise in prices that we've been seeing? Is it due to uh, a, a snap back from a restriction of supply and an increase in demand because of the COVID economic downturn, or is it something else? The other thing, a big takeaway here is what inflation can do in the long run. And this is a pretty basic chart, but it uh, has a lot of information in it that I think might be valuable to you. Um, this is showing the growth of a single dollar invested back around 1926 and how much it has grown um, in the intervening period. And you see there's a big disparity here. The red line starts out and is worth less than 10 cents, you know, eight or nine cents on the dollar. And so uh, on the top, we can see small company U.S. stocks, which is worth five or six thousand dollars, all the way from one dollar to five or six, compounded over this time. So what are we looking at here? Well, the red is the is the uh, basically what inflation did to the dollar. So if you took uh, a bunch of cash in 1926 and stuffed it in your mattress and weren't earning any interest or returns on it and you took it out of your mattress to spend today, you could only buy eight cents worth of goods and services relative to what you could have bought back in 1926. So in other words, the value of your dollar has declined over 90%. Now, the green line here, which is kind of hard to see, but it's basically pretty flat, is another definition of cash, which is U.S. Treasury bills, and the only difference between the green and the red is that if I had invested in treasury bills, which were at any point in time readily convertible into cash, um, I would earn interest along the way too. And as you can see, the green line is fairly level here, which means that the interest I earned on my short-term treasury bills, which typically, you know, the, the measure here I think is, a, is, a, is one month, um, and I convert them, convert them into cash at any time, um, I earned enough interest to overcome the effects of inflation. In other words, the interest I earned was about equal to inflation. All the other types of investments here, these returns are after inflation. So I earned additional money in terms of interest or earnings growth above and beyond inflation. So it shows that over this period of time, investment markets have more than compensated me for inflation and also other investments such as gold, um, and treasury bonds have also made money above and beyond inflation, even though the dollar is has lost 90% of its value. So that's the big takeaway. And then you can also see the variability in some of these numbers um, start, as I mentioned, post-World War II, uh, establishment of the Federal Reserve. You see volatility in gold and interest rate uh, investments uh, start up um, as the Federal Reserve was established and you started having management of uh, the value of the dollar and we substituted uh, positive inflation to uh, in exchange for volatility. Um, so this is the red line is the extent to which the dollar can lose purchasing power and has mightily uh, over time, but it can be overcome by different types of investments. So what are the types of inflation? Um, well, they can be from supply being restricted and we can go back to the uh, energy crises of 73, 74, and then again in 79, which were associated with the, the uh, great inflation, peacetime inflation back then. 
uh, where the supply of oil was constricted by OPEC. There can be demand shocks, um, such as a recovery from World War II or a recovery from COVID, where uh, the economy has been down and all of a sudden there's a huge surge in demand. Um, and, and frankly, in COVID, we have a little of both. We have uh, restricted supply from the shutdown of manufacturing and mining and oil extraction and other activity, mineral extraction, um, factory activity in general. And then we have resurgent demand as economies shake off COVID and come back out to play. And so uh, you have those two forces meeting together. So that is certainly some of what's going on in the price increases uh, we are seeing uh, today. Um, Another type of inflation, which is frankly the one we're most concerned about and the one that scares us the most, is monetary. And the general definition of this is if you create or just create money out of thin air um, uh, in excess of the rate of economic growth, so in other words, more money that's supported by production of underlying goods and services, um, if you have more money chasing fewer goods and services, uh, it should become worth less. The money should become worth less. And as I mentioned in the talk uh, on the market uh, review, we have monetary and fiscal stimulus due to COVID right now that is in excess of anything we did in World War II, um, greatly in excess of uh, economic activity, even considering COVID. And so uh, we also have um, uh, budget deficits, uh, accumulation of reserves in the central banks, a lot of things that we haven't seen before, which have been inflationary in other times and places in other countries. Another type of inflation, which isn't really inflation, is the effect of technology. And one would expect that with technology, we learn to do things better, we get more computing power, our machines become more energy efficient or more effective at what they do in terms of manufacturing or farming, that that would have an effect of the effect of reducing prices. And indeed we see that, uh, especially over the late 1800s in the agricultural uh, and mining and other uh, types of industries involving uh, manufacturing and extraction of resources that prices declined as technology aided us. And so um, one could ask the question, well, hasn't that always been going on? And the answer is probably yes. And, um, you know, that's a healthy kind of deflation. Uh, but if you have inflation constantly rising, which we have in, in the last uh, post-World War II period, uh, the inflation problem might even be a little worse than we think because it's canceling out that, that deflation and that improvement from technology and then piling on uh, additional price increases, uh, which might be masking the real uh, underlying effects. Um, and, uh, one thing that's typically also associated with the pa with past periods of inflation is psychology. And, you know, we might be seeing the beginning of that now where you have used car and car prices and home prices and securities markets going up, up, up. If you get into a psychology where people think I better, if prices are going up, I better buy a home now to, since if prices go up higher, I'll, I'll never get in or cars are in uh, short supply, I better buy one now or I'm gonna have to pay a lot more later. Um, and then it seeps into wages, which um, we are especially seeing wage increases for lower uh, income people that, you know, this, uh, I gotta get ahead of this. I gotta, I have to uh, get um, an increase in wages to keep up with these prices. That becomes a snowballing psychological uh, effect, which, probably contributed greatly to the great inflation in the 60s and 70s. Um, so uh, let me just go on to the next slide. So what's happening now is we don't really know how much is due to the inflation and demand effects of coming back from COVID and how much is due to a change in the monetary regime. Um, uh, but we are worried uh, that we were going to pay a price for the actions that were taken to recover from COVID in terms of monetary policy and fiscal policy on top of what we did to recover from the great financial crisis in 2007 to 2009. This doesn't mean we are betting that inflation's returning. Uh, 
but as I'll show you shortly, conditions now are a lot different than they were over the previous 40 years. And I think one would be negligent if they didn't prepare their portfolio for a higher probability, not a certainty, but a higher probability that we might experience higher unexpected inflation than the marketplace thinks. Um, and how do you deal with inflation in the long run? Well, you can restructure or default on debt, which is bad for people buying bonds. Um, you can raise taxes to pay debt service costs on the debt. And we're, you know, we're basically, by borrowing so much now, pushing off consumption into the future, which means taxpayers in the future are going to have to pay the debt or service it. Uh, so it's a transfer of wealth from the young or the people who aren't even born yet, who can't even vote now, to us in the present. Um, but you can raise taxes, which is politically very difficult. Um, defaulting is very difficult. Or you can just print money, um, which is what a lot of the Latin American countries do uh, uh, and, and some of the African countries and, and Germany in the, in the 1920s did that to def deflate away the high value of debt they inherited from World War I. So if you print money, uh, you're creating a lot of money, getting it into the economy, into the hands of people, and you have more money chasing a, a uh, slower growing basket of goods and services. So the money becomes worth worth less, or becomes worth less. And so it's easy to do um, because politicians don't really have to vote on anything, higher taxes or defaulting on debt. But it's really a stealth tax because purchasing power becomes worth less. It affects everybody who spends money, disproportionately hits the poor and lower wage earners because they can't protect themselves. So it's like a tax on everybody um, equally, who, and it hits those who consume their wages more than those who uh, save. Uh, and, but it's easier to do, and historically, ultimately, it is always the choice. So what's different now? that makes us think we might uh, experience the money printing element here uh, and that would result in higher inflation than people are expecting. Well, here's uh, federal outlays as a percentage of our GDP have skyrocketed upwards. You can see recently there are two uh, crests here. One is in the intervention for the great financial crisis and then the consumption of, uh, of um, our uh, uh, spending as a percentage of the size of our economy dipped back below 20%. And now, um, just in two, this is in 2020, this would be even higher in, uh, if we accounted for 2021 spending. Um, you can see it's sharply going up, and there are a number of different new spending proposals on the table uh, in addition to what you're seeing here. Um, and so these federal outlays, if we don't have the tax revenue, uh, will manifest themselves in higher debt, which indeed is what we project. Um, this is the federal debt is a, is a percentage of the economy. And you can see here's World War I on the left, World War II, and then uh, the Great Recession here is uh, we came out from into 2010, uh, the pandemic in 2020, and then it's just projected skyward after that. Um, and, and a lot of that is due to increased Social Security and Medicare spending, uh, and as well as ongoing fiscal deficits. So the debt here, uh, uh, academic studies show that it starts to have an adverse effect on the economy when this number hits 80%, which we hit uh, as 80% of the size of the economy, which we hit um, in the mid-2000-teens. Um, so uh, we have debt that we've never seen before in the history of the uh, republic uh, staring us in the face. And then uh, central bank assets, this is money that's been printed not just by the US central bank, but around the world created basically out of nothing when we go out and buy our own bonds uh, to maintain liquidity in the bond market and keep interest rates down. And this is also, um, this is just in terms of dollars, in trillions of dollars. Uh, so you can see the, the world's central banks um, 
have aggressively inflated their balance sheets to buy our own bonds. Um, and this is a subject worth hours on its own as to what that means in the future. But we basically created money out of nowhere to buy our own bonds uh, as a result of the general financial, the uh, financial crisis in 2008, and then again here in COVID. So this is another thing that we haven't seen since actually since World War II. Um, and then here is the world dollar liquidity and measured as um, U.S. bonds that the central bank has bought with dollars it created, plus bonds that foreign central banks own. It's a measure of world dollar liquidity. And you can see that's exploded upwards. So there's a lot of dollar liquidity out there that's grown very quickly. Um, again, this is different in the last 40 years. And then in terms of the money supply, um, we've had this surge in M2, which is money that's basically in the hands of consumers to spend and can directly affect the economy. And this is a surge that we haven't really seen since we've been measuring M2. Highly, highly hot money, inflationary money um, that's working its way through the economy. And you can see through, through the, this time series, we haven't seen anything like that before. Um, and then also on ter in terms of interest rates, if you look at 10-year interest rates, um, the last time we experienced high unexpected inflation in the mid-60s and 70s, we had this big run-up in interest rates, uh, which uh, the, the Fet Paul Volcker um, uh, at the tail end here helped instigate to tamp down the economy and tamp down inflation. Since uh, 81, 82, we've had this spectacular decline in just near continuous decline in interest rates. Where we haven't experienced unexpected inflation um, and that decline in interest rates has been a big wind at the back of bonds, real estate and stocks. And we can't reasonably expect to see this in the next 40 years. So we have a number of elements working again, working um, kind of against us in a way that weren't around most of the last 40 years, which was a great environment for stocks, bonds, and real estate um, that have changed just in, term, in a magnitude that none of us would have thought possible 10 or 15 years ago in terms of um, creating money to buy our bonds, in terms of deficits, in terms of government debt, in terms of central bank reserves, in terms of the decline in interest rates. None of these things are probably repeatable. And so a lot of these things are have historically in other places and times been a recipe for high inflation. So I'm, gonna, I'm at the tail end here and I have a, 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 a chart here which shows in four quadrants um, going upward is um, higher inflation and going from left to right goes from a deflationary bust. Uh, so deflationary bust and low inflation would be a period like 2007, 2009, or the depression. And a disinflationary boom is a little, pretty much most of the time what we've been living through the last 40 years where we had interest rates go down, taxes, tax rates going down, um, wages going up. Uh, all these favorable things um, uh, for corporations and their profits. Uh, and we never, we didn't really experience inflation. Now, if you go back to the 60s, mid 60s, 70s, we were somewhat in this inflationary stagnation um, in the Carter years where we had a slow growing economy, but inflation. And then in um, 79, 80, 81, we had uh, we, we had the economy growing, but we also had really high inflation. So you can see these are the types of investments that do well in that environment, emerging equity, emerging uh, country equities, real estate, commodities, um, uh, those types of things that aren't normally talked about today as headliners in, in client portfolios. Whereas the types of things down here on the lower right are the things that have done well the last 40 years. But in terms of inflation, you're gonna see things like commodities, EM stocks and gold and inflation protected bonds uh, doing relatively well. And so 
um, if you think that the conditions underlying the economy are more favorable for unexpected inflation today, and we're not saying it's going to happen for sure, but I'm certainly more worried about it than I was five years ago. It makes sense to increase your allocations to these types of investments in your portfolio um, to a higher degree than maybe they are now. Um, and how far you do that would be uh, in proportion to your concern uh, and the how much that underlying evidence weighs in your mind. So here's an, a, a chart out of a recent article um, on going back to inflationary regimes over the past century, not just back in the 60s, to show the over, overall performance in terms of percentage returns uh, over the past century of gold, commodities, real estate, bonds, equity, mar equities. And then just looking at the inflationary regimes, and you can see uh, gold, commodities, inflation index bonds, and energy equities are the positive um, investments in, in those categories. Now, so why is this important? Why not just be in these investments on the left and hold them? Well, because uh, many of you out there have retirement time horizons. Uh, maybe you're in retirement. Maybe you've got 20, 30, 40 years. And these inflationary regimes uh, can, can dominate your retirement experience. It, it really matters not what happens over the last 100 years um, it matters what over your retirement horizon what happens. And some of these inflationary regimes can take up most of the retirement horizon. And so for those you the, the investors like you who are in that position, who may have shorter time horizons, this is important to take a look at this and say, if I am worried about inflation coming in higher than people think, maybe I should put a little bit more in some of these other categories. And if you're younger, well, maybe you just stick to these uh, traditional stock bond investments um, and ride it out. Although I think the magnitude of what's happened in terms of money creation and some of the other things I talked about is so great that it may have longer lasting effects in markets. It's, it's possible and it, it, is, it would be prudent to uh, hedge against that possibility. And to kind of finish up, we have a slide here on what happened uh, from 1970 to 1980 um, and it's a logarithmic scale um, on, on uh, from the 1970, what did well during that infl period of inflation. Um, and you can see things like um, uh, uh, gold and, and uh, the, the S&P GSCI is the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. So this would be um, investments that are uh, sen uh, sensitive to underlying commodity prices. Um, and then the... Uh, uh, return um, uh, on consumer price index, uh, if, uh, stock, developed market stocks, and then the S&P, um, that some of these inflation-sensitive investments did very well during the period of the 70s. So just an idea of some of the types of things to think about. So thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I hope I was able to uh, give you some thoughts uh, to think about in uh, uh, in addition to what we generally see in the media, that things over the next 40 years, it's possible they may be quite different than what we experienced in the past 40 years. And some of those uh, historically in the U.S. and outside the U.S., over a long period of time, some of the actions we've taken have eventually resulted uh, in uh, inflation that was higher than expectations. Thank you so much for your time.